morning. How you guys doing? All right. Seem actively conscious. That's good. All right. So a couple, couple of quick, quick things. I, we, uh, I really appreciate the work you guys have been putting in this week on your presence. I've seen, I've seen you guys in lab, and I, I've talked to a lot of you. Um, that's, <clears throat> that's great. So I want to, I want to kind of, uh, if you haven't talked to us uh, yet, uh, I want to put out a couple of things that may, that may help you. Some of these problems, these projects we've given you are there to like provoke you uh, to, to, to learn things that you might, that you might not have, um, that, that you might not have tried yet. There's nothing like giving somebody like a problem to just kind of push you to learn something new. Okay. And so I, there's a, there's a, there's a couple things that I can show you that may simplify some of your, some of your projects for you. And that, that's what I want to start the day with today. So again, I'm, uh, you know, going to have this recording. Uh, so don't, you don't need to write anything down, but the, the main thing is just, again, the like pattern that I'm doing. Some of these may not even apply to you, but they may be useful to you in like other projects and stuff. So just maybe keep an eye out here. So the biggest thing uh, that is going to help you guys out is the ability to talk to uh, specific objects within a list or, or like, you know, certain points or certain, uh, certain numbers. And I'll, I'll sort of show you what I mean by that in just a second here. And again, some of this may be, I, I may have shown some of you this, so it, may, it might be, um, it might be review, but I do want you to see this principle because it's really important. So we're going to start with an SDL line. And you guys all know these by now. It's a line that has a start point and a direction and a length. I'm just going to make uh, a big horizontal line uh, for the first, the first get-go. Okay, so I got that. And then I'm going to divide points, uh, divide curve. So we just get 10 points. All right, fair enough. So a component that's really useful that will be useful for you guys is called list item. Everything, once, so we, we started the, the, uh, the semester, we had the, uh, we had the number sliders, and then we moved into, so we, so we could control one thing, and then we moved into adding the series and the range components, so we had lots of things, okay? When you've got a lot of things, and you want them to talk to a lot of things, by default, they're just going to talk to each other. So if I have 10 points and I have 10 circles, they're going to talk to each other. Or if I have 10 circles that I want to rotate 10 different ways, they're going to talk to each other. But what if you want to rotate each circle like a little bit differently? What if I have a list that's got 10 different rotations and I want to talk to it in a certain way? Or what if I have a list of points and I want to draw not to each point, but to every other point or to every third point or to every fifth point? Like, how do I do that? Okay. Some of you guys have these like basket kind of weedy projects, like the Shumi. Uh, the, the one that actually does look like a basket, the, uh, the, uh, that, that sort of like apartment building. And so you're, you're stuck you, you, like up against this. Like how do I get these things to angle when all they want to do is go straight up and down? Or what if I have a big list of points and, but I want them to be straight up and down? So I'll show, you, I'll show you what I mean by that here. So if you look at the uh, curve, <clears throat> sorry, if, 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 if you look at the list of points, I've got 11 points. You take a list item, plug it in for the list, by default, it's looking, it, so what, what this does is it, it, it gives you back like whatever that, that, that index uh, i is. And right now, uh, i is zero, and so the green point, the very first point of this list of points is highlighted. If I put in a number slider, just for illustrative purposes here, let's, let's, do, let's do 20 or whatever. So I can talk to the index and I can ask for, okay, so give me point two. Give me the third point, the fifth point, okay? And so I can, I can extract a specific item from a list if I have that like list item thing, right? Does that make sense? And so again, I've probably talked about this once before, but now it's becoming like really relevant to us because of the kinds of projects we have, okay? And this kind of thing becomes useful when you want to do something like this. So I'm gonna take this uh, line and I'm just gonna move it and I'll just Make a copy and show you quicker. Okay, so I got another line, and I've got a bunch of points on that line. So basically, don't want to make that seem too complicated. I've got I've got two lines, and I've got the points on those lines. Okay, then I've got the I've got the item, so I can I can have. So I'll make a line between the two lists. So right now I've got list item nine, and list item nine. Okay, and actually I need a better, need a different line here. Line, yeah, AB, okay. 
So we'll do the bottom one connects to the top one. Can you guys see that green line? OK. Let's just do this way. So now so I've got point 0.9. So if I wanted 9 to talk to 9, that's what I've got. If I wanted 9 to talk to 10, that's what I've got. So I can actually like have the two things talk to each other in any, in any order I want. Because again, I have a list, and I just want to get a certain item out of that list. Okay, so that's that's a one to one, right? Now, how do you do it with like a bunch of these things? Okay. Okay, so if if I have one input, I get one output, right? Okay. So if I want a lot of these things, right, I need I need a lot of inputs. So instead of having a number slider to give me the index, I could use a series. All right. And this is where having a little like sketch pad in front of your computer is really going to help. What you're going to do is you're going to write down the numbers. You're going to write down the addresses of all the people you want to call, right? So let's say I want to talk to 0 and 3 and 5, and I want them to talk to 1 and 2 and 4, okay? We can do that. In fact, before I even do that, let me do this. I'll do a panel, and I will... Um, I'll do the numbers in the panel because this will also work too. Oops. Yeah, let's make it data. Okay. And that should give me. Yeah, so that, that gives me three, right, that are talking to one. <coughs> okay, that makes sense. And I can put another panel in the other one. So I can explicitly like type it in, but that's not parametric. Okay. But I want I wanted to prove a point to you. I can do a series. And you know, series starts starts in a number, has an increment, ends in a number. And so once I when I've got a bunch of sliders in my series, um, that's when this gets really parametric, right? So I can change. Well, here I'm changing the. Uh, ah, that's not what I want to do. Okay, I got the starting number and the ending number. And the number of these things, let's make these all, well, anyway, just, let's do it this way. So my, num my starting number is 2. My increment is 2. That gives me 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. And that lets me extract those uh, from, that, from that list there, that list of points there. Okay. Um, let me, um, so I could, if I start with 1, now, oh, the, the the issue is my is my data. So I don't want to I don't want to wrap this. Yeah, there we go. If you uh, so what 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 wrapping means is is that if you like if you if you shoot the list right if you have too many it's going to go back around again and it's going to try to catch like more more numbers. So if you're not getting the result you want, one of the things you can try is, is to tell it not to uh, not to wrap. That's actually my problem with this one here. So. Okay, so let's take a look at this again. I've got too many. I've got too many numbers here. Yeah, so you can see it's actually it's actually letting me letting me change that. Okay, so it's a, I'm asking for um, two, three, and four. Oops, these are backwards. That's that's my problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I start with two. And an increment at three, so I got two, five, um, and uh, seven. I think, yeah, two, five. Well, two, five, eight. I'm sorry. So, point two, point five, point eight are talking to point nine. Let me just play this a bit here. Okay. So, if you wanted to do like a truss or something like that, if you wanted to do some some kind of a rhythm, you could figure out which points to skip and which points like not to skip, and you could basically give it the instructions. I could also put a series in. For this one up here, uh, so I can't spell series today. Series, all right. And I can do the same thing. And if you get these right, and you get you get the patterns that you want. So right now they're the same, but I could begin. I could begin to change these. So if I skip. And depending upon how many of these I have, I'm getting some overlap here. But uh, so let's, yeah, okay. Yeah, 
So if we get the right, if we get the right count, it's gonna work. Okay. So if you, so what you, what you might want to do is write yourself a recipe. So you go through the numbers and you say, okay, so I want, if I want these things to be angled, I might want point zero to talk to point two and point two to talk to point four. And basically that would give me the pattern I want. So you basically, you're going to use the series to find the algorithm that's going to give you the addresses you want. And you plug one in for the base chord and one in for the top chord. And that's going to give you that like pattern. Okay. If you want these, so, so this is going to work and, and uh, I'll, I'll do this and then I'll show you the next step. So the problem is, is that this works for one row, but a lot of your things are like multiple like rows, right? So how does that work? We'll, we'll talk about that. It's the same idea. So let's do, so there you go. Like this, this algorithm, you know, here I have zero and I, and I'm, so it's zero, two, four, and I probably want, you know, more of these, but yeah, zero, two, four. Um, let's see these I want though. I want this to be two. So we're going to start with two. Yeah. Okay. So again, if you just, if you know what the numbers are of, of the points you want, you can use series to give you the algorithm to recover the pieces you want. And then you've got, you can make these with lines. Okay. We'll talk about this in a minute. I want you guys to start, if you're doing this kind of thing, and I know it's a solid in the, in the um, model, start with lines first. Okay. <laughs> Don't try to do it with rectangles or extrusions or anything else. Like sim simplify your life for yourself by just doing it with lines first. We'll talk about this in a minute, but this is what I mean by like breaking down problems into things that you can solve. Okay. Before you solve the whole thing, like what the final form is, just lines are very easy to work with. Right. Okay. But they're the basis for other geometry. We can pipe them. We can loft them. We can sweep them. Okay. But just, just work with lines for now. It's like one less thing to, one less thing to worry about. Okay. Any, any questions on like this part before I get to the, to the whole, you know, to do like a whole series of these things. You guys cool with two of them? Makes sense? Okay. Well, that's pretty cool, right? We can, I mean, we haven't used series that way before. Like, we're using series to make an algorithm to, uh, to actually get these. All right. So let's go back. Um, this is going to hurt me. Okay. Let me, let me just do this. And then I will I'll copy these. We'll, we'll do this again here. Okay, so I'm going to start again with a line. But I'm going to make a bunch of them now. Okay, because this is more like, more, like what you, more, more like what you've done. So I'm going to say move in the Z. And I'm going to make a series of these. Because, right, if I plug in a series for move, it's going to give me like 10 of these things. Okay. Going back to week three again. There, a little bit better. Okay, and then I can do divide curve. Oops, not that one. And plug it in for, so now I've got like a bunch of points. And the points are, are actually, so this is actually grafted, right? I had one line with like, with like 11 points and then I copied it, you know, 10 times. So you can see it's kind of it's kind of grafted. You can't see the points. It's in these this n equals eleven. That's what each of those groups are. are. Um, in order to talk to these the way that we just did, we're going to flatten these. And remember, flatten destroys the the organization. So instead of having you know uh, ten groups of eleven, we have one hundred and ten things. Okay, we've just got one hundred and ten things. And what that enables us to do is this. And I've shown this before, but I don't know if you guys have been using this, but it's really effective to do like a, a, a text tag. So a tag is going to let you place some text uh, on your model uh, at certain locations. It makes it really easy to visualize. So my, my text tag right now has uh, these locations. And then for the uh, amount, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, do a series. And This. I'm gonna, I've got the list length. This tells me how many things I have. So if I, if I have a list length, that returns the number 110. So whenever I change this thing, that, that list length is always going to give me the total number of things I have, which is really useful. We'll, we'll use that later. So I have a series that starts with zero, increments by one, and we're going to do it 110 times. And what that does, it's really dumb. It gives me a list of numbers from zero to 110. But what, what I'm going to do with that, though, is use it for the text tag. And actually, let me... Um, let me play with the spacing. This is too, this is spaced together too closely. Is this going to hurt? No, it's not gonna, that's going to be fine. Okay. 
So check this out. So now we have numbers. Oh, I don't like the decimals though. This is the pattern I did. I did this a couple weeks ago. So I take, a, I take an integer and it just removes the decimal. So now I've got the addresses of all of the points in that, in that huge array of points. So you can see it's pretty, it starts at the corner, it counts from 0 to 10, and then it counts from 11 to 21, and, and like so on and so forth. Okay. So now if you wanted some of the, you remember the, the, the like basket thing? It's, it's these crossing diagonals. Well, you might know that you want 0 to talk to 98, and 1 to talk to 87, right? So you could get the diagonal lines like running across these things. Like you, you, could, you could take this like, you could actually print this out, draw like what you want, find the addresses for what you want, right? And then use series to like recover those lines for yourself. Does that make sense? Okay. Now it seems like it's like, oh my God, that's a lot of work for a bunch of like lines, right? But when you do it, it's parametric, right? Because if you, if you plug in series, so that it knows what this length is, and it knows how many times you're like doing it. No matter what size this grid is, you're always going to get that diagonal, like no matter what. Okay, and that's where it's really cool. Okay, it is a lot of work if you're doing it one time, but it's not if you're making it a parametric assembly. Okay, so let's let's try to do this. So I've got a list of points here that are going to go. I'm actually going to go from zero to nine because ten's not going to talk to like anything. Okay, on the bottom. So I'm going to do a series. That's going to go into a list item that's going to be plugged into our list of points here. And the series is going to start with zero and it's going to go to now. This is the part that you're going to want to make, you know, eventually you're going to want to make this parametric so that when the thing changes, let's see, where's my, so the end here is going to be the end here. So let's just go ahead and make those a number slider from the get go. Uh, I'll do this 20. Might as well. And I broke everything because you can't have zero of something. Okay. So let's make this a little bit easier. So I've got a series of numbers. Oh, plugged it into the wrong thing. All right. That's, that's something else. Okay. Starting at zero. And I want to go to four. Actually, I want to skip one. So I'm going to do an expression. So C minus one. So now I should have one through four. Oh, zero. Oh, maybe I don't need to do that. Actually, it's good to check. Okay, zero, one, two, three, four. Good. Okay. And if I plug this in, I get zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, makes sense. Now I want the other, the other series to be this row. So it's going to be. Uh, ooh, okay. So it's going to be. In this case, it's 35, uh, 29, 23, 17, 11. So what's, what's the first number that I want to start with in the series? If I, if I'm gonna, I, I, wanna, I wanna do this. What's my first number in the series? What's my cursor under? 35, yeah. Because, because I, I, I can count any way I wanted to. So here I've just done zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, but if I want zero, it wants to talk to 35. So the first one that's going to talk to it is 35. You can start a series like anywhere, right? You don't have to start at zero or one or two. I'm going to start mine at 35. Okay, so I'm going to do 35, and and I'll I'll later on I'll figure out what the math is for this. I may even have to change my. Okay, and then okay, in order to get 29, what do I have to subtract from 35? I know, we didn't have to do math this morning. Come on, it's Friday morning. Boy, you can count. Six. 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 I want to take six away from it? Okay, six. Okay. So, for now, just for this example, and then we'll refactor it, we'll do negative six. Ah, there we go, right? So that, that works. Like, that is a pattern. That is a pattern that works. So if I plug in these two, I get my diagonal lines. Okay, so I, I'm explicitly now. I'd probably have to go back and figure out what that what that algorithm is. So it's actually going to be, let's see, five. So I've got five, which is this slider here, and I've actually got this series here. Let's put in a slider for that too. This series has five. Okay, 
Now I've actually got, I've actually kind of screwed that up here. But, uh, okay. So let's say, let's see here, five, one, two, three, four, five, six. And it's going to be, it's, so it's actually, it's, um, it's six times six uh, minus one. So it's this times this minus one is going to give me that number. So, so basically you want to, using, using the math components, you want to, you, you want to multiply these by each other so that you always, you always end up with that right number. And you can verify this experimentally to figure out what the algorithm is. So I could, I could increase, oh, <laughs> we broke it. So we know, so if it's six, then this number is 41, right? The one that we want to connect it to. If it's four, the number is 29, okay? So what you have to do is figure out that with the number that you have in this dimension and the number you have in that dimension, how do you multiply them and if you, do you subtract one, do you add one? So that the very first number in this series is always, is always right, okay? And so you just, you just have to experiment with it, but, but you get that idea. And then you can go ahead and you may find out that, as we found out in this pattern here, the way that I'm, the way that I'm doing this, we, we may not be able to, because, because of the length of this list here, we can only go up like five in order to get that angle in the other, in the other, in the other direction. So we may not allow the program to ever make, to, to, to ever make more rows uh, and to, I mean, to ever make yeah, more rows than we have columns, okay? Because, because we're not going to be able to get that, that, that angle that we want, okay? Does that make sense? So this is, this is kind of the process we take. Like, we don't exactly know. Like, there isn't, like, there's a general idea of using the list item to get, uh, to have one thing talk to, to, like, another thing. But to actually figure out how it works for our design is this process of, like, iteration. Okay. You want to you want to try to find out how to do it like one way that works well, and then start to parameterize it. Okay, and you figure that out by basically changing the parameters and then finding out the conditions so that it always works. Okay, it's a very it's like an iterative process. Nobody just like sits down and just cranks this thing out. Okay, you get something to work, you make sure that it works, and then you add one thing and you make sure that works, and you add one thing and you make sure that works until you get this. Okay, once you've done it this way. <laughs> You can take the structure and you can do it the opposite way. So I can start counting at 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and I can talk to 6, 12, 18, 24, et cetera. Right? And as long as you got that algorithm, it's, it's always, it's always going to give you this really nice grid. Okay? And that'll work for any shape because you're, you're just talking to points. It actually doesn't matter that these are in the x, y axis because you're just, you're just looking for the addresses of these points. These could be on circles, these could be on some kind of complex shape. Okay? That's what's really beautiful about this. So for some of you guys who, who had these projects that had these, these diagrid kind of things, like, like using the, uh, the list item is a really useful thing. Using list item is really useful for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of like, reasons why we would want to, um, to talk parametrically to objects in a certain order. And using a list item and using series is a, is a really good way to do that. Okay, so hopefully it helps a couple of you guys. The other thing that I want to talk to you about, uh, I did talk about, I talked about using lines and how uh, that was what I wanted to start you with, but then how would you actually make that, something like that into a uh, solid? And I'm going to show you that. So if I take, I'm going to do a circle, and I'm not going to give it a number slider. I'm just going to make a circle. Aha, okay. And I'm going to make a copy of that circle. In some direction z okay and then i'm going to divide if i can spell divide curve today divide curve there's not nearly enough points there okay let's do 50. nothing and nothing okay so some of you guys have this project this is the um and I'll, I'll show you, so um, you could do the method, so for something, for something that's a closed shape, you could do the method that I just showed you and you, you could figure out and basically have a list that's, uh, well, you, you could do, 
a, a, like a series that's zero, uh, one, two, three, four, and then another list that's um, one, two, three, four. Like so, basically, so you have zero talks to one, one talks to two, and that would give you the the same thing for this. If you have an enclosed shape, what can work really well is an item called shift list. So instead of making having list item and having the series and actually figuring out the algorithm, what shift list does is it actually will shift the entire the entire algorithm. So basically, it, it it does what I just said. It will shift the list by one offset. So I could have a list of zero, one, two, three, and it would become one, two, three, four. Or if I had a shift of two, the list would become two, three, four, five. Like it would it would just move that list around. It's almost like this. It's like a ring. And you take what was at zero, and you, you're moving it so that now two is there, okay? In a in like a metaphorical way. So this this is actually even simpler yet. If I take my list of points, and I plug it into shift, and I've shifted it, this will actually give me the angle already. And what's cool about this is is that if you take the number slider. Um, we'll plug in some other values for this here. I think I've showed you this before, but so now there's no shift, shift one, shift two, shift three, and this only really works well for these kinds of like things. It's not a, it's not a catch-all. It works particularly well if you have a closed shape. But notice what happens as you increase the shift. It's actually going to go off plane. I mean, maybe you like that. You might want that because they have longer to cross. Okay. But it's not going to solve your problem the way that the other one will if you could talk to like point to point. Okay, it's just a little bit different algorithm. But that wasn't my 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 point in showing this. My point in showing this is actually how do you make the like surface? How do you make it a solid so that I can like manufacture it or I can render it? Okay, because right now it's just a bunch of lines. Okay, I'm gonna hide this real quick. So. I I think I showed some of you guys this. Definitely my my second years might know this. There's a command called sweep that exists in Rhino. Uh, don't disable. Enable. Okay, here we go. So I'm just going to give you a, a, a Rhino demo before I parameterize it. Sweep is a is is one of the most common ways of making of taking a line or a series of well, lines and making them surfaces. Okay, we've done it with lofts before. Okay, but a sweep is a little bit different. A sweep takes a cross section and like a spine and it like ex extrudes it along that that shape. Okay, so if I sweep, so the rail is is what the spine is, and the cross section is 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 what's there. And what you get is, is that. So you get, you get a tube, and you you could cap it, and you're and you're kind of done. This will work for you know you can put cross sections on both sides, and you could you could draw any kind of spine you want. It could be three dimensional, it could be a, a sweep. And what this will do is it'll sweep it. It's kind of like those little Play-Doh extruders you have when you're a kid. You put a shape, and you and you and you, and you like draw a line with it. So that's actually what this is, and this is perfectly suited to a lot of the things that we are working on. What's wrong with cap is that it doesn't really make um, nice like square kind of edges. It makes tubes, right? We don't always want tubes for things. Okay. So if you wanted something that had like a square piece of, uh, or any kind of arbitrary cross section, a sweep is going to really work well for you. The other thing um, that you have to note about sweep is that the cross sectional, the spine has to be in the center of that cross section. Okay. It's like how when if you rotate and you don't have the right position for the rotation, it, it makes weird artifacts. Okay. You've got to place that spine in the center of, that, of all the cross sections for it, to, for it to do what you want it to do, okay? Or it's not going to work right. So knowing that, let's get back to this, and I'll and I'll show you how to apply a parametric uh, sweep. So first of all, what we want is we don't we have our, our spines, which are which are decent. These are our, our like rails that we're going to sweep things on, okay? What we don't have yet is our cross section, okay? My cross section is going to be a rectangle. Okay. And we go back to our friendly rectangle pattern with the domain. Construct domain, because we changed it. And I'm actually going to do, yeah, do something like this. Remember this pattern? 
We'll do negative b. Oops. I want that. Come on. Expression. Negative b. And this is going to create a parametric uh, square for us. Okay. Okay. So we got that. And then, okay, I can I can distribute these things. And what I'm actually going to do, I'm actually going to do horizontal planes or frames. So this is what we did um, in the brick example to get the bricks to align to actually curve with it. You could do this without it, but they're not going to they're not going to curve with a circle. So you want to do horizontal frames. You could because I could just plug in um, these points for these rectangles, but you notice that they're not they're not angling. Okay, we don't want that. So instead, I'm gonna I'm gonna make um, a series of horizontal frames on the circle. So actually, I'm actually gonna go back to our circle, and I'm gonna make the same number of frames as points, and that's gonna set that up. Okay. So I don't use the points for anything. I'm actually just and it's, and it just happens to work out because it's the same curve and it's divided into the same number. And then I'm gonna use those frames to position my rectangles. And frames generates a lot of visual garbage, so I'm going to hide it. See, so check that out. Now those are aligned properly. All right? Okay. And then I've got all these lines here. And I've got all these frames. So, sweet. Let's see if this works. So, rail, section, and miter. I don't need to worry about that. So, the rails are these guys. And the sections are these guys. Oh, it doesn't like us. Sweep could not be created. All right. So we have an issue with all these. Okay. So the issue is, is, is again, something. Oh, and this, ah, this is an issue that comes up. Okay. So we did something, and we thought it would work, and, and it didn't work right. So we have to do some debugging. So the, the first thing is, this is a really good lesson. Uh-oh. I may have done something. Yeah. Explodey. Whoa. It happens to all of us. No. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what we wanted, right? <laughs> no, this is actually a really, really good lesson for why, like, I, I, I taught, like, flatten and graft, like, over and over and over again. Um, this, is, this is actually really instructive for us. So, First of all, I'm going to delete this before it yeah, crashes my computer. Okay, so first of all, we talked about how the number of objects like matters. Like when you have one object that talks to one object, no problem. One thing that talks to many things, they're all going to get changed the same way. Many things that talk to many things, you have many things that, that change a bit. One of the other things that's really important, and this builds on what we just talked about in the first thing, is the, is, is the like, data structure itself. And I've covered this in different contexts, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to cover it in. What's broken with this thing is that it doesn't actually know the order in which these 50 things need to talk to the other like, 50 things. It would seem to be really straightforward, but in things like loft and in things like um, uh, sweep, it needs, it needs the structure, it needs a more complex data structure. Okay? And this is where graph comes in. So, so graph puts things into groupings, right? And if these things are both in the same kind of grouping, then they can talk to each other, okay? And that's why I had to graph both of those in order to get this output to be, to be right, okay? So just, just know that when you're dealing with these, with these commands that have multiple inputs like that, that, that sometimes graphing both groups before you put them together is going to get you the, the, kind of, the kind of connection you want. And it's just because it doesn't have the right structure. Um, and so again, if I plug these in, um, I'm just going to graph them here, and I'm going to graph these uh, here before I plug them in. So rectangle, actually rail, I'm sorry, and sweep. And so that's actually going to, that's going to give us what you want. Now, <coughs> excuse me, what happened before when this thing like broke is that is again, if the data structure is mismatched, you get really weird things. So what I had when I accidentally clicked on this was I had one of these grafted but not the other one. And so what I was trying to do was, was apply each one of these to all 50 of those like points. And it's going to do it like recursively. So it would be basically 50 times 50. All right. 
So it was doing, it was gonna do 250 of those things. That's where we got the overlapping. So you really have to be careful about your data structures. Not only do you have to have them match so that it'll, it won't break, but if you match them incorrectly, you can overload like the whole thing because it thinks you want everything to talk to everything, okay? So matching, matching structures is as important as matching quantities. Does that make sense? It makes sense because if you don't do it, it doesn't work, you know? So if it doesn't work the one way, then do it the other way. So anyway, but then we have a bug. And I don't have like a, I don't have uh, an explanation like for this, but I do have the solution for it. So you see how there's a rail, there's a one rail, and there's like a two rail. You guys notice that one? There's, this says sweep one. I'm sorry, sweep one, sweep two. Right? Um, actually, take that back. We we'll do something else. So we could do so. A, 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 we we could try with a sweep, but in this case, the sweep is like buggy for some reason. It's not. It's not finishing this off. Okay. Sweep might work for you. It might not work for you. The other thing you could try to do is you could try a loft, right? We could try a loft if we had the bottom section and the top section, and we could like loft them together. Okay. Sometimes things are just buggy and they don't like work for any explanation, so we have to work around it. So the way I want to work around it might be to do it. Uh, with a loft. My problem is, is that I don't have those sections on the other piece. So I'm basically going to copy this and plug in the top cord and that'll give me those pieces. So now I've got bottom ones and top ones. Okay. Okay. So now loft is probably, so I can plug in, so plug in this group and now see it doesn't, it doesn't like that. Actually, let's do it without it first. You guys have probably had this problem before. Okay, so I plug that in and Loft is happy. It seems to be, it didn't throw me an error, right? But what happened down here? What it did was it lofted from, from each one of these things in, in, in like order. Okay, that's what I wanted to do right away. So a lot of you guys will have this problem where you'll see something, and I'll actually show you an example in a second here, but it's like taffy being stretched all through your thing. That's because there's no structure to it, right? It, it thinks you want these things to be, to be uh, lofted in order. What we want is for loft zero to talk to loft zero, loft one to talk to loft one, right? Do the whole thing. That's where grafting comes in, okay? And if I graft this, it breaks it. And it should because now there's no companion to it. Like there's, you can't have a loft with one cross section. It's not gonna loft to anything, right? But then if I shift click this and plug it in, they do finish the loft because the structure is right. I'll show you. But it doesn't move along the rail anymore? In this case, it's not, just because they happen to be aligned like that way, the, the, the rail is sort of like superfluous. A rail, I, I showed you rail not to, to fail spectacularly, but, but because sometimes rail is like the right, is the right tool. In this particular example, there is something about this configuration that it doesn't complete that, that rail, and so you need to do a, a loft, okay? But, the, and, and I wanted to show you these also because um, the, um, the principle of data structures applies to, well, applies to everything, but it applies to, the, to, to loft and to uh, sweep. So you can see, so you can see the data structures are the same. See how it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, like that little, that little, sort, of, little sort of thing that has it in like brackets? That means it's in a little grafted group. Zero, 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 0001. So they're, they're like similarly structured, and so it knows that these, this zero talks to that zero, that one talks to that one. Okay, does that make sense? So, so grafting is not, it's not like magic. It's formatting it so that it knows what to talk to properly. Okay? If you don't do it, this is gonna, this is gonna crash. So, yeah. So it's not gonna, it's not gonna like you. You know, it's not gonna work or it's, it's gonna give you incorrect geometry. So in this case, especially something like loft that you just plug everything into, you need to think about the structure of what you, of what you plug into it. Um, okay, any questions on like what I just showed you? That's probably relevant to a couple of you guys, right? The hard part comes when you do it like multiple stacks, but I'll leave that, I'll leave that to you. So, so data structures is really important. I'll show you, I'll show you one more example and then, and then I'll show you some, some other stuff here. Um, okay, we'll do another line SDL because it's our bread and butter. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, re, I'll repeat this, but in a different, uh, a different context, basically.
Okay, so I've got I've got a line here, and I'm going to move it twice. <clears throat> oh, that didn't do what I wanted to. Okay, let's do a bigger one. Um, let's see here. Okay, this one. And we'll do this again. So this is a variation of the column. Okay, and then I want to oh. oh, actually, you know what? I'm not going to like this. Okay. We'll do this a little bit differently. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is we're going to do a series of louvers. A couple of you guys said these louvered things. And I want to I demonstrate how lofting works uh, in, this, in this kind of uh, activity. So this is going to this is going to apply to a couple of you guys. So I'm making a couple rows of lines right now that I'm going to use to, to position the, the louver pieces. Uh, let's see here. Lost my own way. Okay. I was going to do it with points, but I'll do, I'll do it with a subdivided line instead. Make it easier. Okay. So I've got this cord, and we'll do this one. Okay. <clears throat> so I've got these, and I can and I can divide these up. So the way this is going to work is there's going to be, so you, you can do these kind of fin louvers if you have a line and a line at the bottom and then a twisted line in the center and that's what gives you this kind of fish gill. And I think I showed you guys this in a video, right? But, but it, the way, the way, why this is interesting is, is like how you loft uh, multiple copies of these things. Okay, this is where this actually becomes, um, can become kind of a, a problem, okay? So um, I'm going to use rectangles to give this thing a little bit of depth. I know I said I use points, but this will make it a little bit interesting. So we'll do construct domain. So this is a pattern you should be pretty familiar with at this point. Uh, number slider B expression minus B. Okay. Okay, so I've got this. And I'm actually going to Oh, and actually, that's not what I want. Usually I want that, but I don't this time. So usually we're doing squares, but today I actually want a rectangle. So I'll have one slider for one dimension. Yeah, and one for the other, okay. So you can see that I can, I can play with those. So I'm actually gonna do, I'm gonna do this. So there's one little fin there, you see that? Okay, and I'm going to have this bottom one is going to be this set, and this top one is going to be this set. Okay, all my fins here. Let's hide some of this stuff. Let's get in my way. Okay, so you can see the collection of fins I've got. Now the middle ones are the fun ones. Are the ones that are, are the ones that we're actually going to uh, to uh, change. So I'll do the same thing with another set of rectangles that I'm going to rotate by some amount. So let's plug it in the geometry. Now the problem with these is, is that they need centers. Okay. 
And let's just leave it like that for now. I'm not, I'll, I'll play with it a little bit later, but. So the issue that's gonna, that, that happens with these, why, what makes this all relevant, is that when I try to loft these together, so I grab the top one, and the middle one, and the top one, is you get that. You get taffy, okay? Because most, most people would, would expect it to, to uh, work, right? Because it's like, I've got three things, I plug them in an order, and they're all the same number, right? So by all the stuff I've been telling you this whole time, they should just make the loopers, okay? But they don't, okay? And this is, this is where they have to be, like, structured, okay? So I use this analogy a lot about, like, the pack of gum or, like, packs of gum. So this idea that, that you can either have, like, 30 sticks of gum or, 10 pack, or, or, or three packs of 10 or 10 packs of three, right? So right, most of the time, it's just structured like pieces of gum. In order to get these things to talk correctly, you want to put them in packs, okay? And so like this thing wants like 10 packs with three pieces of gum in it, right? So pack one talks to pack two talks to pack three. And that's what graphing is going to do. So if you see something like this visually, you know that that's what's happening is it's not structured correctly. So I'll go in and actually I need to, <laughs> You don't want to do it uh, in the computer because, or while you're plugged in because it can cause it to, to crash. So if I graphed all these and then I loft it, I'll get it, I'll get it correct. See, if it's broken, not so broken, not broken. <coughs> I'll give you guys a bonus here. And I think I may be repeating myself, but so if I throw a range in, and radians, and multiplication, that's the A, okay. So that's all the same rotation, but if I give them different rotations, it gets, gets cooler. It's parametric. Zero to three sixty. Yeah. Hmm? So I can change the change the rotations of these things. And the data structures thing, I know it seems kind of arbitrary or whatever, but, but it matters when you have a lot of, of something and it's built out of a lot of something, okay? These things get like, we're basically creating like an exponential increase in the complexity of the like script, okay? It was a lot easier with, with like series when I had 100 things and I wanted them to behave 100 different ways. Now I've got a thing that's made out of three things and I want the middle thing in it to behave like a different way, okay? And so that's where having the, uh, knowing like when to apply the data structure and when, when not to becomes important. And that's what I did with you when I gave you these projects. Almost everybody has to encounter that when they are dealing with their precedent project, okay? So hopefully those three kind of patterns, like list item and sweeps and, uh, and lofts with, uh, with like the graft, okay, are, are really gonna help you out in these, in these projects, okay? We'll talk about this later on. Like this is a you know like a louvering pattern. Right now I'm controlling it graphically, but I can have some other kind of data like actually controlling that. You know like 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 the sun angle or the wind or like the or like the solar uh, you know like radiation. Okay, so like you know this piece right here is going to become some kind of performative data in the future that's going to tell you like what that wants to be built. So you set the system up and the data is going to tell you what the form wants to be. Okay? We'll get to that much later in the class, but I want to set that up right now. Right now we're just messing around, right? But in the future this is going to be like what saves us, okay? This is how you develop smart things in your buildings. Okay? You have a program that responds to the environment. We can do that. Some of you guys, if someone has the project with the things that open up that kind of rotate, right? That's another variation on this as well. Okay? Okay. Any questions on the patterns we got for today? Okay, so hopefully this will help some of you guys if you're, if you're stuck on some of your projects, okay? Okay, let's finish up here with a little brief, a brief little lecture here.
So we're talking about debugging and diagramming. These are things that are going to follow up on the work that you guys are, are doing with the precedent project. One, because debugging is basically what we do. Like, a lot of programming is debugging, which by which I mean fixing problems with the stuff that you, you, that you made. I do this all the time. Like you saw just right now, I make, I make a lot of mistakes or something doesn't work the way that I want it to. How do you like fix it, okay? That's a huge part of computational design is debugging, okay? It's, and a huge part of, of, of figuring out a design is, is debugging, okay? The second part is diagramming. It's like once you've got one of these things, how do you talk to somebody about it who's not a computational designer, who's not an architect? Okay, we struggle with this like all the time. So how do you how do you visually show someone what's happening in your in your process? How do you explain to a client like that when the temperature goes up, this thing is going to change and, and and like and like the way that it works? Okay, so that's what I want to talk about briefly today. We we'll begin to talk about there's a, a midterm quiz that's going to be coming up that's going to just test your knowledge of 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 computational methods. Um, I'll talk about that. So. The quiz is, is, is a test of what you understand as individuals. It's my way of seeing, I know you guys work in groups, it's my way of seeing how well the knowledge has been, you know, sort of like distributed. Are you working together with your partner to solve it or is, or is your partner solving like all of the, all the problems? And it's not to get you or your partner in trouble, it's really for me to understand like how well we're understanding the concepts and the material. Because at the end of the day, the concepts are all that are really important about this class. It's not really important to understand grafting but it is important to understand the notion of like data structure, that, that, that information has structure, okay? And it's important for you to know what an independent variable is, and it's important for you to know like what parametric design is, okay? So those are the kinds of things that are gonna be testing on the, the midterm quiz. It's not, don't worry about it, it's not like high stress. More than anything, it's just a chance for you to review what you know, and for me to review what you know, all right? takes place the week of 9.30, so it's two weeks from, from now. It's not, it's not like immediately. It'll be in your lab. All four sections have a different like quiz, so there's no reason you can't cheat or anything on it. Um, they're all gonna be different. It's multiple choice short answer, so it's not like I'm gonna expect you to make a script or like write a script in class. It's not that kind of pressure. A lot of it's just like vocabulary and concepts and some IDs, like I might show you something and, and you might have to tell me like what it does or, or, or what the, you don't need to write all this down. We post these online. You can, I mean, if you'd like to, they'll keep you awake. Um, but um, again, it, it, and I'm gonna tell you exactly, I'm gonna tell you exactly what's on it. Um, so hopefully it's, it'll help you, help you figure that out. It's individual, there's no groups on the quiz that make it a little bit harder. You can use notes, you can use Grasshopper in the lab. It's fine with me. Like, You'll always have access to computers like in your life anyway. Like there's no reason why you can't access them. If you think it'll help you, by all means. Um, you know, no cheating obviously, et cetera. What I'm gonna be talking about, I'm week to week. Remember, what are the topics for each week? What are the things that you did in your lab reports? What are the things that I like, talked about? That's what the quiz is about. Variables and relationships. So I might ask you like, um, you know, what happens when this value changes to that variable? And you could just you could just look at it and say, oh well, that there's a multiplier and it's got a three that multiplies it by three, right? I might say like, show me in this in this like uh, I'll, I'll show you a script and I'll say, show me where the variables are, show me which ones are independent, which ones are dependent, right? If nothing's connected to it, it's probably independent. If it's connected to a bunch of things, it's probably dependent, right? These are all pretty straightforward things, okay? It's just a test of your knowledge. Positioning, I might ask you some, so a lot of things about, you know, putting, how do we put things like next to each other? How do we like space things apart from each other? Positioning is a huge thing. So I might, I might show you a bug with positioning and I might ask you what the solution is to it. I'll give you multiple choice, right? Remember putting the box on top of the box, putting the box next to the box, like things like that, right? You see a box inside of another box, how do you get them to be in the right position? Okay, I'll give you four options. Okay, distribution. If you have something, how do you get it into a grid or how do you get it into a series? How do you get it to go like along a line, right? I'll, I'll give you like a list of, I'll give you a list of like components that you might use or, or like a strategy. How do you get something to flow along a line? Horizontal frames, right? Oh, so just, just recall of some of these like tactics. It's really important as you're working computationally to start to think about the stuff automatically and that's what I want to try to test you guys on. The less you have to think about it, the more you can think about design, okay? I'm not trying to like catch you in anything. I'm just trying to test your your like recall of this stuff and how well it's sinking in. Topology is going to be is going to be a big one. This is one you want to focus on. I might say, okay, if you've got points, 
what's a way to make them into a line, right? And the easiest answer to the question is the line component, right? You put two points in, you get a line, okay? Uh, if I've got a line, how do I get points out of it, right? You can divide it, you can get the endpoints of it. Like, that's the kind of thing I'm interested in is like, how do you transform from like one of these to another? That's a huge thing, okay? And I'll probably just say like, give me one option or, or I might say choose, choose the right option out of four and they'll be pretty obvious which ones are, which ones are right, okay? So just, so just think about topology, think about, this is really key for the project you're, that you're doing right now, right? Because eventually it's like, you might want to end up with a surface. So like, you know, lofting will get you a surface, sweeps will get you a surface, right? There's all, you know, so, so think about the, the things that you've seen before and, and, and know at least one or two ways that that's possible, okay? And then lastly, um, common bugs. So just, if your thing is taffy, like I just showed you, right? Like, what kind of bug is that? It's a, it's a data structure bug. How do you solve it? You, you make the data structures like mash, okay? So stuff that like has happened to you in lab, because I made it happen, are gonna be the kind of bugs I'm gonna test you on. Because that's the kind of knowledge I want you to have, is like immediately when you see that something's not lining up right, then you know that that's, that's a mismatch in the data structure or a mismatch in the amount, and you just know what the answer is, okay? You shouldn't, you shouldn't have to struggle with it. None of this stuff is a trick, none of this stuff is new, it's just recall and like review of the stuff we've been doing before, okay? Um, and if you guys, yeah, so anyway, so that's just basically what's gonna cover. If you look down the topics week to week, you look at the lab reports, like that's what's gonna be, okay? All right, so we talk about debugging a little bit here. One of the things, and you can, we'll just kind of go through this really quickly, you, you can review these slides later, as I know we're, I know we're getting close to time here, but Debugging, a bug is an area of problem that causes a crash or, un or otherwise unexpected behavior. So it's something that you like don't intend to happen. And these, this happens like all the damn time, right? Even with a, when stuff is supposed to work like correctly, there are some things in Grasshopper that just unexplicably like don't work right. Debugging is a practice of finding and resolving software bugs. So debugging is removing, removing bugs. Why is studying debugging important? 75 to, uh, 50 to 75% of programming is, is debugging. This is true for novices as well as professional programmers. In fact, it's actually more true with professional programmers. They don't have to think about design as much as you do, but there's still errors in logic and the things that they make that they have to iron out. And so if you master debugging, you've mastered like three quarters of the problem of computational design. Because I guarantee you, especially the first or second time you try to make something work, it's not gonna work right the first time. In fact, if it works right the first time, it's actually worse than if it doesn't work because then you're like, it's actually almost scary if it works right because then you don't know if there really is a problem with it or if you're just that good. Most of the time, it's just, there's a problem with it, okay? So my code works, my code doesn't work. Programming is hard, okay, okay. So uh, uh, the best thing in, 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 in to avoid, you know, to, to avoid debugging is to avoid making bugs in the first place, okay? The second thing is to learn techniques for locating and, and solving bugs. So there are like strategies that I'm gonna talk about really, really briefly here that you can try like when you get stuck as opposed to just trying to trying everything until it works, okay? And then lastly, you wanna learn from the bugs that you make. So you wanna know that something happens or something that I did like caused a problem and then you don't do it yourself. And this is really a, a good key of learning about computational design. The best way to limit debugging is to avoid making bugs in the first place. So how do you do that? Have a plan, like good design prevents bugs. This is why I ask you guys to sketch stuff out first because it helps you like avoid any kind of logical errors. If you wanted to do, you know, the thing with the, um, with the diagonal lines, you know, actually writing down what those coordinates are, you know, if it's zero, two, four, six, eight, you know, doing that, doing that rather than thinking that you're gonna remember it in your head is a good way to avoid having a problem in the first place, okay? So planning and design are really, are really useful. Know what you're gonna do and, and have an idea of how. That's why we have navigators, because a navigator keeps the plan and has a plan. So you're not just plugging stuff in again. So this is structurally built into the class to help you guys avoid uh, making bugs, okay? Having a partner is a great way. Slow down, don't procrastinate. I guarantee you if you try to do something at the last minute, it will cause bugs because you're not able to think about it. Like you, you're not able to follow a plan. You're making more mistakes and it's just gonna tangle your stuff up and it's not gonna work. The most important thing though, and we'll talk about this, this is based on the kind of process I've been talking about for design. 
for designing anything is not to design the whole thing at once or to try to implement the entire plan at once, but just to do one small thing and to make sure it works and test it before you move on. Okay? Even if it's like something just like dumb. I mean it's like it's like make sure that it draws a line, you know, right, before you try like lofting it. Make sure that it actually draws the line you want. That way you don't have to go back and figure out where the like where the error was. Because you know because it's the last thing you did that's broken. Right? So you don't don't do two or three things at once, just do one thing at a time. Okay. Um, keeping your script organized and variables labeled is, is another thing. And you can do this as you go or you can just say afterwards, but especially if you come back to it later, you may not even know like what's going on in your own program if it's, if it's not organized. Using panels to leave yourself notes is a really great idea. Like put yourself a little post-it note or your partner. This is what I was trying to do and it didn't work right. We'll come back to it later. Or this part of the script is the part that like lofts all this stuff together, right? So you put that little piece in there. If you have to stop working, you can use a panel to remind you. This is a really great idea, especially if you're up really late at night or you got a lot of things going on. You don't want to spend 15 minutes figuring out what you're doing in the first place. So drop a little panel in before you save it, give it to your partner or whatever. It's a really good idea. Professional programmers like do this stuff all the time. Okay? The bigger the program, the more important this stuff is. And your programs are going to get pretty big. Finding and fixing bugs. Some, some bugs are easy because they will crash the script and they'll throw you a little error. They'll give you a little red flag and you just find out what that error is and fix it. Others will do things that you don't expect. The worst thing in the world is when you, you, you think something's supposed to happen and nothing happens. You have no clue. Like what's, it's, like, it's like you lit a fuse on a piece of dynamite and it was supposed to blow up and it's not, and it's not blowing up. So you, know, you have to really cautiously approach that. You, know, you don't know where the problem is, okay? So um, you know, these, are, these are worse. Which is why panels are really great because a panel will at least show you something, right? If there's nothing in the panel, that's, that's interesting. When there's supposed to be points or there's supposed to be numbers, why isn't there anything in the panel, okay? If there's nothing on the screen in terms of geometry, it might be because you didn't turn on preview or something. Like it might be like a benign kind of bug, okay? So finding fixing bugs. If a script is broken, work backwards. If you have an error message, start with the error message, right? Look at the big red thing, work backwards. That's the first thing. Check to make sure you satisfy the inputs. Sometimes you plugged in the wrong thing into the wrong thing. Sometimes the input, like the worst one is in series. You can't have a series that has zero numbers in it. You won't get anything. You can't scale something by zero because it doesn't do anything. So that's a bug, right? That's an easy bug. You didn't put more than one curve into a loft. There's your problem, okay? So look at the inputs and trace your way back to find the mismatched data. The other thing is, is mismatched uh, structure. Right? Nothing comes out, check that structure. Okay. Look at your newest code first. This is why it's good to do things incrementally because the last thing you did is probably a thing that broke it. That's where you should start. Okay. Remove it and start over again. If you only did like one or two things, it's really easy to start that one piece over. Okay. Isolate things and test them before putting it back in the script. What you could do is you can even open up another script and just do a little piece of that. Just, just say like, I think that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And you kind of simulate it. Just simulate one chunk of it. Make sure you understand it and then plug that back into your script again. Okay. Maybe, you're, maybe that's not your problem. Maybe your problem is before all that stuff. Okay. So, so isolating ideas is a really good idea too. Visualizing, visualizing, visualizing is huge. See what's going on in your script. The numbers tell the story, not the geometry, like not the stuff that comes out of the program. Okay? You don't get good stuff if your numbers aren't right. Okay? If you don't know what your numbers are doing. So you gotta use panels, you gotta mouse over your stuff to make sure that it's piping in the data the right way. It's just so key for, uh, for doing this. Check the inputs, uh, and then you know, type amounts and structure. So is it expecting geometry and you gave it numbers? Right? Is it expecting points and you gave it lines? Like did you just make a mistake? Did you slip up? Did you try to match one to 50 or 50 to 50? Is it, is it grafted when it should be you know, flattened or flattened when it should be grafted? Okay. A really, really useful thing to do is to talk to somebody about your script and, and try to explain the problem to somebody else. Sometimes you get, well, all the time, you're so deep in your own head like trying to do these things that you think you're to doing it totally right and you understand it, but you've convinced yourself over the last 45 minutes you know, into some crazy theory. <laughs> One of the things that, that, that programmers uh, have done is this thing called talk to the bear. And so you get like a little stuffed bear and if no one's around, you like try to explain it to the bear. And sometimes that's a good way to get unstuck. Now, 
rather than talking to yourself or talking to a stuffed animal, that's why I try to give you guys partners, all right? Try explaining it to your partner or to another person in the class, and it's a really good way to get unstuck, okay? Because you're laying bare all your assumptions. They aren't thinking about the way that you're thinking about it. They're gonna ask you the right question, and like you're gonna figure out the answer, okay? It's like taking a shower. It's like you'll, you'll like, when you stop thinking about it or you think about it in another context, suddenly it makes sense to you, okay? Rather than taking a shower in the middle of the lab, you can talk to somebody, okay? It's a really useful way uh, to make that work. Okay, being systematic is really useful. So like the worst thing in the world to, to do, and I'm sort of guilty of this sometimes too, is to just kind of say like, well that didn't work, I'll plug something else in and maybe that'll like fix it, right? Because you don't really have a, a theory in it, like anymore. And what happens if it does work? Like how are you gonna do that again, right? So like, if you're gonna if you're gonna do any if you're gonna make any changes, be systematic about how you do it. Like like make sure make sure you know what's being plugged into what. Have your partner like talk through like what ought to be there. Don't try things randomly. Like if you get it to work today, you may not have like learned anything, and that's a big problem for me. My my whole thing is for you guys to learn this stuff. Okay. If it doesn't like make sense to you, but you got the right answer, that's a problem for me. Okay. Uh, a good idea before you do anything is to save a clean copy. This really works too. If you, again, if you get really deep in your own head and, and you're doing this, save a copy before you started like messing with it. Because again, once you fix it, you'll want to go back and, 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 and actually try to figure out like what, what were the right moves to make. If you don't save a copy, you can make it worse, right? And then you'll never get back to the way it was, okay? So save a copy. <clears throat> now this is gonna sound really weird because it kind of negates a lot of stuff I've been saying, but try to work in long stretches. One of the things about programming is, is that you have to get in that headspace of like what's going on in the program, like what you're trying to do, like what, what steps you, you took. You're, you're kind of like in the program. You guys kind of experienced that for a while. If you're working in really short stretches, you haven't had a chance to load the program in and like, and like get into it and then make your changes and then kind of figure out what's going on. Um, it, does, it just doesn't work as well as if you can sit down and look at it for an hour or like two hours, okay? It's like you have to load the program in your own brain before you can actually like work on it in the computer. And it takes a little while. And if you break your concentration, you break your focus, you almost gotta start all over again. So try to schedule like a decent amount of time, especially when you're starting on a project, you know, for the, 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 for the, for the first time. Um, and then once you've done that, it's, you get to a good stage, walk away for a while. This is where like, coming up with solutions to things kind of strikes you. Uh, I did, the, just this morning, I was thinking about these patterns and, and, I, and I actually had like, a, I was like, oh, I, I could actually do it like this way instead. And I had to be not sitting in front of the computer. I had to have had it loaded in my head, but then I was like walking to school and I had an idea about how to do it, okay? That probably happens to you guys like some of the time, right? Oh yeah, I could do that. So walking away from it is a good idea. Okay, learn from previous bugs. When you see a bug and like, you see it crop up often enough, I hope you're just learning from it, you're making notes about it. You know, when, it, when I show you something and I tell you that it's a bug, you should make notes about it. You're doing that. Learning from your mistakes is like the biggest, is the biggest thing. Um, input selection of patterns, so like, so like knowing you know, that you're using a pattern correctly, making sure that you're doing things in the right order are, are, are really common bugs, and data matching as we talked about today is a really common bug, okay? Okay, diagramming. So we're gonna talk about this really quickly. So this is what I'm gonna, we're gonna be doing. Uh, so on Monday, Wednesday, I'm gonna come in with you guys and JP and I are gonna help diagnose your problems. If you guys have already got your precedent like figured out, we're gonna like, we're gonna help you optimize it and push it in another direction. If you still have stuff, we're gonna help you figure it out this week, okay? Everyone's gonna have all their stuff figured out like this week. The week after that, we're gonna actually create a presentation of, of, your, of your script, okay? You're gonna uh, make it beautiful in a way that other people can understand, okay? And that's gonna be diagramming. So like, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about like a nicely vectored, like line art kind of diagram, okay? Like we've done in studio a little bit. <clears throat> and this is the kind of output, you know, that, that I like, like this little, like the one that I showed you at the beginning of class. You guys didn't know Grasshopper the first day, but you could follow the kind of process that the architects used to make this like form. That's what I want you guys to do. So some of this stuff is just a simple rendering. Some of, it's a, some of it's like line art, you know, using line art, uh, line color, line type. A sequence of, of steps that is illustrating the states of your program. So again, having the lines, you know, using those two. So <laughs> maybe with like the move command and scale, divide curve, interpolate points, lofting, oops, right? So 
What, remember that Rhino is like state, or uh, cross, uh, that Grasshopper is state based? So you can use the different states of your program, right? When it's lines, when it's points, like when it's curves, and show them in sequential order, and you can get a presentation that you can show people. So I'm going to teach you a technique for getting that stuff out of uh, Grasshopper and making it line art. Okay? It's very similar to what we did in third years in uh, second year. Okay? With uh, May 2D, that sort of thing. Okay? That may that may horrify some of you, but that's the technique. And then you can see, you know, like other examples. But basically, what you want is you want a you want a graphic story that explains like how the script works so that you can go to a client who's not computational and they can understand it. And they can tell you like what they want to change and how much they want to pay you, okay? Which is going to be a lot of money. Um, so this is this, is this uh, tower, this like uh, snowflake tower. And it's, it's this really complicated cross section. There's a lot of different, there's like uh, seven different variables in it. And this, this illustrates like what happens when you, when you change those variables. And then, and then, and then there's, a, there's a curve that determines like where the cross sections come in. So the two things that you can change are the sections. It's actually a rail sweep. The sections and the rail, you can change the two of them. And you get different, different tower forms. You can see when, I, when, you, when you change the shape of the curve, it actually changes that, that like scale of the piece. So these are the, the, the sections, and this is the curve. And so you can see the same script can produce a lot of different outputs for this project. So they, they can quickly iterate this like tower design. Okay? So this tells the story. So you can see the different cross sections. And then here are the different variables for it. That's the kind of thing that I'd like to see. Now, there's other kinds of diagramming. Like some of you guys could use this in studio for your massing, like for your massing studies. You could use parametrics and then take certain parts of it out of sequence and then just show them how you got from one form to another. Okay, so it's kind of like a, it's, so you can take this as like a series of conceptual um, moves. This is how I think about parametric design myself. Like, I got a box, it's divided a certain way because of my site. I start shifting those things up and down. I start like, you know, sort of like rotating them or actually like, you know, like taking those corners and digging them. I start to divide these up into, you know, windows. These become void. So this sequence, like any layperson could understand this sequence, these are actually a series of parametric moves, right? To get from one form to your project. That's really useful to have, okay? Same with this kind of thing here. It's kind of pushing and pulling and like articulating. So parameters are not just a generative tool, but they can be a presentation tool as well, like to, to kind of get your scheme across to other people, okay? So that's where we're gonna be headed with this. I'll post these videos, and if you guys have any questions about your project, let me think you know. There'll be a video about diagramming posted, but you don't need to watch until next week. Okay? Thank you guys.